So, Mario Maker 2 finally got its own direct and we got a lot of new information about Mario Maker 2. Like, a lot of new information. So what we're going to do in this video is to take a closer look at the whole direct, we'll discuss things that were easy to miss, speculate a bit about how to use all the new items, discuss some thoughts on the new features and talk about the stuff that was missing. So you ready? Let's do this! Alright, so the Direct featured so much new stuff and information that I can't possibly talk about every frame in detail, so what we're going to do is to go through the Direct chronologically and only discuss the more interesting things. So the first interesting new frame is this one. This confirms that we're going to be able to control the lava level and to make lava rise and sink in a castle theme. Sadly, this is only going to work in castle stages, which is a bit weird, adding rising lava to underground levels would definitely have been cool, but it looks as if Nintendo wants to make sure that the different themes really feel different, which is all right I guess. This frame contains another small bummer. It looks like they added no new semi-solid platform styles to the existing themes. It's no huge thing, but getting a couple more background styles for the semi-solids would have gone a long way in helping to make different stages look different. The first really cool new thing is shown here. It's going to be possible to add descriptions to the different courses in the sequel. That's no huge addition, but a pretty important one in my opinion. If we built a really strange puzzle level for example, around a super weird, unintuitive mechanic, then adding a small explanation in the description should really help to make players understand how our stage works. I'm really happy that they added this. Also for anyone who was still hoping that Nintendo Switch Online isn't required for Mario Maker, it is. Here we have the confirmation. So here we have something that's easy to miss. It's not the slot conveyor belts, though those are cool, but the semi-solid platforms. So it looks like it is possible to fill out areas with semi-solid platforms in the sequel, because in the original Mario Maker it is impossible to place the semi-solid platforms like this. So next, this frame. First, there is this black water at the bottom, which is probably just how the water looks like in a Mario Bros. 3 jungle theme. Second, we can see mini pipes here, but not only are there mini pipes, there are actually sloped mini pipes as well. So there are a couple of things I wonder about the small pipes. First, are they able to spawn enemies? And second, well, um, where is the mini mushroom? It doesn't really make sense to me to have small pipes without the option to become mini Mario, so that we're actually able to enter them. I find it really suspicious that they haven't shown any new power-ups so far. Like, more power-ups is probably among the easier things to add to the game, and are something the community clearly wanted. Either they're saving a couple of surprises for E3, or they plan to sell a power-up DLC at some point. But I simply can't imagine that there are no plans to add more power-ups to the game. So as it turns out, they actually showed off a new power-up, they just decided not to show it to us. So weirdly enough, the Japanese Direct is the same as the English Direct, with one exception, during this frame we get to see the Hammer Bro outfit or the Hammer Bro suit. So no idea why they decided to cut this from the English Direct, but it is super interesting and the Hammer Bro suit is at least going to be in the game in the 3D world style. Anyway, here we get to see a super small addition. The new Super Mario Bros. U theme got a new background push. This push doesn't appear in the first game. There are a couple of new background items in already existing game themes shown during the Direct and I really like that they added those. It just shows that they didn't just port the existing themes over to the Switch, but actually took the time to look into everything in detail and to add small improvements here and there. Here we get to see another small new change. Apparently they changed how the mushroom platforms look in the airship theme, which is yeah, why not? Okay, so the next thing we get to see is how the on-off switches are going to work exactly. And holy fuzzy, that is amazing. So first we get a confirmation that shells are able to trigger the blocks. Later in the trailer we also learn that clown car fireballs can trigger them, which probably means that everything is able to change its states, like bob -omb explosions, forms and so on, which is exactly how I wanted them to work. Second, conveyor belts can change direction when an on-off switch gets triggered. And thirdly, and most importantly, on-off blocks can change the direction of tracks. That is probably the most important addition to the game shown so far, regarding building complicated contraptions. This finally allows us to manipulate where items that get loaded by an input track line travel to. It allows us to get one input to tons of different places. That's honestly a game changer. I can't wait to toy around with this. That's going to be really good. But there is actually also something I don't really like about the on-off blocks. 
it looks like we will only be able to have one set of two state blocks in each level, red and blue. A second two state block color would have allowed for much, much more stuff, like having red blue on off blocks in a stage and having additionally green yellow blocks that get triggered separately by green yellow on off block. But from what we've seen so far, we probably only get one color. Though they nevertheless add an unbelievable amount of depth to the game, so whatever. Next, the trailer shows the seesaw platforms again. So those are actually the one item shown that surprised me the most. Those should be incredibly powerful for a simple reason. Enemies affect them as well, which means that we're able to build simple weight systems. Like for example, there is weight X on the left side of the seesaw. And only if we add more weight to the other side of the platform, the platform tilts enough to trigger a P-switch or whatever. That opens up an insane amount of new ways to build crazy things. I'm also wondering if different enemies affect them in different ways. Like does Bowser weigh more than a Koopa? Does it take two munchers to balance the platform out if there is a bullet bill on the other side and so on. I can't wait to toy around with those. They're potentially a really powerful item. Which brings us to the next really powerful item, the Swinging Claws. So first, Swinging Claw levels, like the one shown during the Direct, are definitely going to be really cool. But second, and much more interestingly, Claws on tracks can pick up enemies on their own, which is a really interesting mechanic. So in the Direct, it looks as if the Claw drops its content as soon as it is close to Mario. But what I wonder is if there is another way to make the Claw drop stuff as well. Like maybe if an on-off switch gets triggered, or if it reaches the end of a track, or whatever. If this is in the game that would be huge. Being able to carry stuff from A to B with claws would be amazing. I really hope that not only Mario's presence makes the claw drop what they carry. Okay, so next are the rising and sinking water levels, which are kind of a mixed bag for me. And honestly, sometimes I just don't understand Nintendo. So let's talk about rising water levels. Getting those to work must have been a nightmare. The thing is, every enemy in the game suddenly has to be able to switch between their underwater and their on land physics while the game is playing. Spiny's for example, behave differently on land than in water. Forms drop down slower, Goombas completely change how to move and so on. If there is only either water or land, then everything is easy to set up. Everything just needs the code for one of the different physics and all the problems that come when something changes physics can be ignored. Getting everything to switch physics flawlessly must have been a ton of work for Nintendo and I'm really glad that they decided to do all those work because the rising water levels definitely add a lot to the game. What I don't get, however, is why the wiggler? They then decided to only have a single theme with rising water levels. Like if you go down the rabbit hole that implementing switching from water to land physics must be, then why not go the small extra step to add it to each style and why not have placeable water tiles as well? The only reason that I can think of why they decided to only give the water effect to the jungle theme is that they're worried that the different themes aren't different enough which, I don't know, that just looks like a minor thing to me in comparison, but whatever. For all glitch hunters out there, the transition between on land and in water is probably something that has good chances to confuse the game a bit. Next, we see vertical sub areas for the first time. There really isn't much to say about them, but hooray! And then we see the new scroll stop for the first time. I love this addition. So first, this stops the camera not only horizontally, but also vertically. And second, there is something I'm really wondering about here. So the thing is the following. The nice trailer lady said, that all we have to do in order to make the scrolling stop is to create a solid line of blocks. So what qualifies as a solid line of blocks? Ground tiles obviously, but do brick blocks and block blocks count as well? What about question or ice blocks? The reason why I'm wondering about this is because it would be incredibly cool if all solid blocks are able to scroll stop. Like imagine a room where Mario has to solve a puzzle in order to trigger a P-switch and once the switch is triggered, the whole wall blows up and suddenly the camera is able to scroll forward. That would be amazing. The dry bone shell is next. I love this silly little thing. It's something that just perfectly suits the game. It should be possible to build a couple of really unique levels around the shell, like maybe a metroidvania stage where Mario starts a small Mario, but by the end he is able to throw fire, has a head replacement that allows him to crack open brick blocks and is able to jump on lava. Really cool small addition. And then, then we finally learn more about the clear conditions. And holy fuzzy, those are much, much more powerful than I expected them to be. So there is a collect all coins objective, there is defeat all enemies, or only a certain amount of enemies, there is don't take damage, reach the goal as big Mario, don't touch the ground, don't leave the cloud and much, much more they actually included our dangerous list of evil as a feature. That's definitely going to add an insane amount of variety to the game. I really didn't expect them to add so many different objectives. Apparently, the level still needs to be finished after fulfilling the objective since the goal X or the flagpole only becomes touchable once the clear condition got met. 
Alright, so this screen confirms another small interesting thing. Apparently, the dry bone fish enemy is no longer exclusive to underwater levels in Mario Maker 2, since we got one of those with a parachute here. No idea how those are going to work when on land, but I can't wait to find it out. Okay, and then we learn about the new story mode. So apparently, Peach's castle got destroyed. And I know what all of you are thinking. How did they manage to destroy the castle again? Well, luckily, we already have a pretty good fan theory that investigates this little riddle. So shout out to Reddit user Dream Somebody. He noticed something that might give the story away. So, um, Super Mario Maker 2 may be the story spoiler warning everyone. So here we see Mario in front of the area where Peach Castle previously was, alongside with a toad saying, See, this is why I'm a cat person. So the theory is the following. Undo Dog erased Peach's castle by accident and now they have to rebuild it. Undo Dog appears in the story as seen later and it would perfectly explain why the toad points out that he's a cat person. Nintendo really needs to be more careful with what they put into their directs. I mean, they just spoiled the whole story by accident. So the story mode is probably required to unlock the different items for the editor. That's a minor annoyance for Mario Maker 1 veterans, like having to play levels for 3 hours in order to unlock change homes again would be a bit weird if it works like this, but overall it's probably for the better. Since showing off all the obstacles once in a level where they are put to good use probably helps a bit to avoid lots of trash levels in the first couple of days and hopefully gives people tons of cool ideas for their own levels. And also, we get something new that we can try to beat while crouching or without coins, so hey there's that. The next interesting thing we get to see are the horizontally moving forms. So those are really cool because they should finally give us an easy way to test for Mario's vertical position. If we want to test for example whether Mario is below this line, then all we should have to do is to build a setup like this, where this thwomp moves horizontally. And as soon as Mario crosses the line, the thwomp activates the contraption and the floor disappears. Hooray! Really great addition. Here we see another small change for the first time. It looks as if checkpoints don't make Mario grow in size any longer, which is a good change in my opinion. Some levels just broke when Mario got big previously, which meant that we had to get out of our way to damage Mario somehow when we wanted to have a checkpoint, which is no longer needed. And then we learn about the night themes. So those really got me by surprise. We actually already suspected that night themes are going to be in the game, but what probably caught most people off guard is that they significantly alter the gameplay. I especially like the lights modifier. That one should allow for really interesting stages. I just hope that those are toggleable. Toggleable? Toggle toggleable? Because, well, because sometimes we probably just want to use a slightly different underground style without flipping our entire level on its head. Also, we haven't seen what the night theme does for underwater airship and castle stages, though underwater probably just gets the lights modifier as well, since that is shown in a separate video that Nintendo of Japan uploaded to their channel. Okay, and then it's time for the probably most interesting frame during the whole direct this one. So there is a huge gap right besides the 3D world style and the text at the top says extra game styles. Styles in plural. So there are really only three things that this can mean. Either Nintendo plans to reveal another game style during E3 as a final hype injection for anyone or they plan to sell additional styles as DLC later down the road or they're actively working on causing the biggest possible marketing fallout in company history. My guess is that they plan to reveal a new game style during E3, which gets added via DLC soon after release, but it could obviously also be option free. So if they add a new game style, the real question is which one. So I think Mario 64 and Sunshine are really unlikely, since Mario's controls in those games don't really translate well into 2D. Same is true for Odyssey, though that is maybe a bit more likely. I doubt that they plan to add a style from one of the Game Boy Mario games, which kind of only leaves us with two options, Super Mario Bros. 2 or Super Mario Galaxy. So as much as I love Super Mario Bros. 2, Galaxy would honestly be cooler. I'd usually say that Super Mario Bros. 2 is much, much more likely to get added, but there is actually a thing that kind of makes me believe they might actually add a Galaxy style. So when doing marketing, it is usually a good idea to increase hype continuously until the game releases. The thing is just, the Mario 3D World style is much more hype than Super Mario Bros. 2 in comparison. Let's say the two new styles are 3D World and Mario Bros. 2. Then, at least in my opinion, it would make much much more sense to show Super Mario Bros. 2 first and save the 3D World style for an E3 reveal close to launch. Mario Bros. 2 is something a lot of people were expecting, but 3D World came kind of out of nowhere. I'm really only guessing here, but I think there's a good chance that they saved the Galaxy style as a final reveal for E3, which 
well, which would be insanely cool. But it could also just be Super Mario Bros. 2 and that'd be great as well. Or they are actively trying to set up huge customer expectations that they then fail to meet. We'll see it at E3. Okay, then the show of a lot of new 3D World items. So first things first, I'm honestly a bit disappointed that so much seems to be 3D World exclusive. Glass pipes and this track block that just follows a breeder online should really be in each game style. The same is true for the blinking blocks and the exclamation block. There are going to be huge differences between the four classic styles and 3D World. Also, um, maybe I missed something, but did they ever show off tracks in the 3D World style? I start to believe that tracks are actually cut in 3D World, which would be meh. But other than that, everything we actually get to see in the 3D World style looks fantastic. I have no idea how Nintendo pulled this off, but the 3D World style really looks and feels like 3D World, even though it is in 2D. It's really hard to judge just by looking at the footage, but it feels like 3D World is going to be significantly different to the other styles. The Koopa car looks amazing though. I hope that enemies are able to hijack it. Alright, so the online stuff is next. So. I really like the changes they made, but I can't shake up the feeling that it's not enough. So first the 100 Mario challenge seems to be gone and is getting replaced by an endless challenge. That makes sense to me overall. First, I think it makes sense only to start with 5 lives instead of 100, since then deaths are much much more costly during the challenge and getting the free 1-ups in each stage is much more incentivized. Second, having the challenge go on for as long as a player doesn't lose all lives sounds much more interesting to me than trying to beat 16 stages in a row. The high score element is also a really neat addition and it's going to be fun to watch streamers trying to beat their personal best in super expert mode. The competitive element probably also means that the option to skip levels is gone. That's a welcome change overall, but if skipping is no longer possible in the endless challenge, then they really should have added a random explore levels mode, just some place where levels can be played and skipped without any pressure. As far as I can tell, that's currently not in the game. The tagging feature from the Mario Maker bookmarking page finally makes it into the game, which is cool. It looks as if everyone is able to tag stages, not just the creator, judging by the screenshot, which is interesting. The comments make a comeback. World records are now shown when pausing a level, which is a tremendous small improvement, and um, and we get a boo or dislike button. Okay, so that is probably the one thing I least expected in Mario Maker 2, and I'm honestly not sure if it is a good idea to allow people to boo stages. I don't know, maybe I need to grow a thicker skin, but I already feel sorry for the thousands of kids that put mediocre levels out there and then get booed into oblivion by the community. Creating levels really shouldn't be something people feel evaluated for. It's always really discouraging to get negative community feedback and I don't quite understand what it adds to the game. I really disagree with Nintendo about this edition and I probably won't hit the boo button ever. I just... I, I don't know. I just think it's really stupid to add options to a video game that allow people to be mean to each other. But whatever. As for things that I totally agree with, I love the competitive multiplayer feature. That's just straight up brilliant. Even the worst stages become fun if you find yourself racing through them against three other people. And that they added an ELO system is an amazing idea that is definitely going to encourage tons of people to play levels that wouldn't otherwise and opens up Mario Maker for a completely different type of player. There wasn't really that much in Mario Maker for people that don't enjoy building stages so far. There really only was the 100 Mario challenge which got old quickly. But competitive multiplayer multiplayer with a ranking system and new levels every time you play, well I doubt that this gets old fast. Because of this, stages that can be played in multiplayer are probably going to get a significantly higher play count versus single player stages as well. Okay, and finally there is this frame. So the boo ring here is clearly moving and stops to follow Mario as soon as our plumber looks towards it. So in Mario Maker 1, boo rings can't move and I spent way more time than I'm willing to admit watching this little clip trying to find out what's happening. Either they just added a new move feature to the boo ring, which would be cool, or there are invisible tracks in the game and the boo ring moves along those. Either way, this boo ring is the one thing that left me puzzled the most after seeing the direct. Anyway, so that were all the things shown in the direct that I quickly wanted to discuss. There is only one final thing for us to quickly talk about and that are all the things that are missing. So first it appears as if they scrapped the amiibo costumes, which would be a real shame. Also we still don't know what amiibos are going to do in Mario Maker 2, but knowing Nintendo I highly doubt that there is no amiibo support. Second, the option to create your own Mario games doesn't seem to be in the game. 
That's another pity. Besides slopes, that was probably the single one most requested feature. And the fact that it isn't in the game probably means that Nintendo is really afraid of Mario Maker affecting the sales of mainline Mario games if this feature was present, which I personally doubt. Also, they didn't really show many new enemies, which I found really surprising. Stuff like Pokies or Fuzzies looked like a safe bet to me. No idea why they decided not to add more enemies. All right, so what are my overall thoughts after the full reveal? Well, I think Mario Maker 2 looks fantastic. They added tons of new stuff, they actually listened to a lot of community requests, they added tons of new ways to play the game, like the night themes, the many many different clear objectives and so on, and everything looks to be masterfully crafted. Mario Maker 1 is among my all-time favorite games and Mario Maker 2 appears to be... well, it appears to be Mario Maker 1 but with much much more features. I'm super hyped. And with that being said, I hope all of you enjoyed this little video. If you did, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe you feel especially seesaw platform today and want to tilt that subscribe button as well. I hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!